Ena mana e ne reo, e na iwi me ne hoe fa, tēnā koutou katoa. Ko wai tēnei, ko Helen Nicholson, toko ingoa, te pōko ko Maturaka, te Whariwanaka o Tāko. Nō reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Kia ora, my name is Helen Nicholson and I'm the Deputy Vice-Chancellor Academic at the University and it's my great pleasure to welcome you all to this special occasion to celebrate Zhu Yi's uh, Huang's promotion to Professor. And after so much disruption following the COVID pandemic or during the COVID pandemic over the last two and a half years, it really is great to be able to hold these lectures again. And indeed, inaugural professorial lectures are probably the highlight of our lives as we get the chance to hear about the research and the journeys of our amazing staff. So today I'd like to welcome colleagues from across the university, as well as students and friends. But I'd like to give a very special welcome to Zhu Yi's family and friends who've joined us this evening. In particular, his wife Helen, um, and children Ruth, Hope and Samuel, his sister Aurora Wang, brother-in-law Richard Zeng, and friends Zephyr and Alex, Gemma and Tony, and Zhiyi's fr uh, church friends who are with us in person tonight. I'd also like to welcome his brother, Ru Huang, his uncle, Haiming Huang, and niece, Jenny, and other friends who are joining us online, Ni Ma, Ni Hao, and No Mai Harimai. As some of you will know, promotion to professor at Otago is not an easy thing to achieve. And in order to be promoted, um, Zhiyi's had to go on through a rigorous process where he's been able to demonstrate that he's achieved sustained outstanding leadership in research, teaching and service. Professor Barker is going to shortly introduce uh, Zhiyi formally, but I just want to say a few words to set the scene. Zhu Yi is a computer scientist who is interested in improving and uh, the performance of computer systems and particularly applying them in health-related sciences. His work is wide-ranging and indeed I first met Zhu Yi um, when he was involved with the project using um, EEGs, brain waves, with Liz Franz in psychology to um, be able to control remote-controlled um, toys with a company in China. Xu Yi's been an excellent ambassador for us, particularly as we've welcomed um, Chinese visitors and dignitaries from our sister city, Shanghai. And I know that he's a passionate and compassionate teacher, not only of our university students, but also he's very keen and willing to share his knowledge with school-aged children to get them interested in the uh, discipline of computer science. So congratulations, Professor Huang, on your well-deserved promotion. I'm really looking forward to your lecture, and I now would like uh, to welcome Professor Richard Barker, who's going to give a formal in introduction. Kia ora. Professor Nicholson. Tēnā koe, Professor Blakey, tēnā koe, Professor McCain, tēnā koe, Professor Wong, tēnā koe. Friends and colleagues, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. It is my pleasure to introduce our speaker tonight, Professor Zhu Yi Wong, to give his inaugural professorial lecture at the University of Otago. As indicated by Professor Nicholson, Zhu Yi is one of our newer professors at the University having received a well-deserved promotion to the position in February this year. Zhe Yi's hometown is Xiang Tan, a city in east-central Hunan province in south-central uh, south -central China. This is also the hometown of several founding leaders of the Chinese Communist Party, including Chairman Mao Zedong. Zhe Yi reports that in childhood, he worshipped worship, him very much. These are his own words and that when Chairman Mao passed away, he was so sad that he cried for 10 minutes until everyone left the classroom, as he was hoping to meet Chairman Mao someday. Following his primary and secondary education at which he excelled, 
Professor Huang studied for his bachelor's degree in science at the National University of Defense Technology in the People's Republic of China. To further his education, he sought and was accepted into a PhD at the University of Amsterdam in 1989. But alas, this dream of attending this university was shattered by the events in Tiananmen Square on the 4th of June 1989. He reports that he couldn't get his passport from the governor at the time, as the governor of the province was instead dealing with protesters. Following this disappointment, Zhe Yi instead returned to the National University of Defense Technology, where he completed his PhD in 1992. This was followed by a stint as Chief Technical Officer for the Mingxi Electronic Technology Company, before taking up a lectureship at the Beijing Institute of Technology in the Department of Computer Science. In 1996, Professor Wong headed south to take up the position of Research Fellow at Griffith University in the School of Computing and Information Technology, before crossing the ditch to join the University of Otago as a lecturer in August 1998. And may, may I say, what a great year for joining the University of Otago. As we celebrate tonight, Zhe Yi has steadily worked his way up the ranks and is now a full professor. As Professor Nicholson indicated, to become promoted to full professor at the University of Otago is not easy. You must demonstrate all-round excellence in each of the three academic domains of research, teaching and service. When the Promotions Committee assessed Professor Huang's research record, they noted the volume of his output, which at the time was 137 peer-reviewed articles, two books, 10 edited books and five book chapters, and three of his papers had been awarded the Best Paper Award at major international conferences. His HOD, both then and now, Professor McCain, attested to the high quality of this work as measured by the quality of the outlets that this work has appeared in. One of the referees noted that Zhe Yu is a world-class researcher in computer science, particularly in distributed systems, computer networking, operating systems, and pattern recognition, which crosses multiple disciplines in computer science. Another referee noted that he has contribute, contributed significantly to the parallel and distributed computing area, playing a lead role in this field in the Asia Pacific region. Leading by collaborating and encouraging, he co-founded the Sun Microsystems Center of Excellence at the University of Otago in 2007, which was one of seven such centers around the world and the only one outside the United States. He has since gone on to found and lead the systems research group. Professor Huang is also a dedicated and outstanding teacher. His HOD noted that Professor Huang has developed more papers in the Department of Computer Science than anyone else, including a second year paper which he developed and has been a required second year paper for approximately 20 years. He has maintained a very high postgraduate supervisory load, consistently among the highest in the department, and because the topics he teaches are very practically oriented, he personally spends significant time in the teaching laboratories. Because of this commitment to teaching, he was nominated by his students for an Otago University Students Association Teaching Award in 2015. Standing out from his service record is Zhe Yu's commitment to outreach, leading the Department of Computer Science's contributions to Hand On Science, now Hands On Otago, since 2010, and the Otago University Advanced School Science Academy since 2017. Zhe Yi has also founded the Hai Tu Coding Club, which caters to school students, primary, intermediate, and secondary, interested in computing, and personally runs two-hour sessions each Sunday during term time throughout the year. At the heart of his interest, Professor Huang is a computer scientist interested in improving the performance of computer systems and their applications. His work focuses on making computer systems faster, smaller, more convenient to use, and more efficient. To hear more about this work, let's invite Professor Huang to the front. Please join me in, in welcoming Professor Zhe Yi Huang. Dakota. Thank you, uh, Deputy Vice Chancellor, Professor Nicholson. 
Deputy Vice Chancellor, Professor Blakey, and the Pro Vice Chancellor, Professor Barker, and my HOD, Associate Dean Academic, Professor McCann. Thank you for your support. And thanks to all my colleagues, all my friends, my family members, for your support, and my relatives online, they are in China, in my hometown, Xiantan, and uh, my brother, my uncle, family, they are all uh, at the moment watching from online video. Uh, thank you all for your support. Uh, because my uncle doesn't know any English, so I would like to say a few Chinese words. Uh, 哥哥嫂嫂,叔叔嫂嫂,谢谢你们在这里能够观看我的这个演讲. Uh, and also because of my childhood friends, they are also at the moment watching, so they want me to speak a few Xiantan, Xiantan local dialect, so I will say a few words. Uh, 谢谢等秀们, 哥哥嫂嫂在这里, 观看过的演讲。谢谢你们的支持。Okay, uh, my family was very poor, and my father thought they should not have any children after their first son was born. And so my mom kept having abortions one after another, and she had two abortions before I was conceived. And she used the same drugs to try to, try to abort me. But however, to her surprise, I was not aborted after several attempts. On the contrary, she suffered huge pain. She, so she pleaded with my father to allow her to keep me, though she seriously worried that I could be disabled mentally or spiritually or uh, physically. So after I was born, she very often, you know, every time when she remembered, she would declare to me, the Lord of heavens was determined to save you. Uh, the Lord of heavens was determined to save you. And this is my picture of when I was 100 years old. I was dressed up like a girl, because in the local tradition, if you dress up like a girl, it's easy to raise up. It will not uh, die early in early age. And this is my childhood picture. And here we have, I think here is the picture of my, uh, me and my brother in front of my grandpa's house. I think you can see this as a clay house. And me and my brother play chess. And this is a photo of me studying. This is a typical scenario. When I was young, I was studying in this kind of uh, environment. And this is not a posed picture. It's a picture my father secretly took it. And this is the Chairman Mao, I worshiped her for so many years. Every year we have to go to Chairman Mao's hometown and uh, we take some pictures. So this is very typical for most Chinese children, especially in my province. So time flies. When I was 16, I sit at entrance examination to universities and uh, I got very high marks. So which enabled me to choose any university in China, like Tsinghua University or Beijing University. And however, my parents thought they could not afford the travel and the living cost. Uh, so they sent me to a university close to my hometown, only one hour drive. I chose to study computer science, though at that time, my idea of computer is just like this, a calculator. No idea of what the computer was. 
So my university, National University of Defense Technology, NUDT, was the only university associated with the Chinese army at that time. When I entered this university, my department was developing its fastest computer in China. It's called the Milky, Milky Way. And uh, this legacy was carried on for decades, and eventually, its supercomputer Galaxy 2, here in this picture on the right, was listed for six times as the top of the World 500 supercomputer. I was ranked the number one when I entered the department and I kept the number one for 10 years until I got my PhD and I left. I was the captain of my class and I led a student computer science society. The official title is the president of the postgraduate computer society. And I swept all awards and the scholarships given to the best students in that university. And here's a picture of me, I think, talking in a, in a party or in an organization. And this is I'm playing magic, uh, playing magic to my, to, to a party. I don't know what it's about. I can't remember exactly what it's about, but it's a celebration. And this is um, the organization of the Computer Society, the second time of a symposium for postgraduates uh, all over the university. And this is our football team. So I was uh, actually the de deputy captain. And our soccer team won the championship of the university in the final year. And also sometimes we have some crazy times, uh, like all young men. So at NUDD, I was selected in a research team led by the father of supercomputing in China, uh, Tsi Yungui. So I was lucky to be in such a great team and made excellent achievements. Other students would have no chance. For example, I was awarded the first class research prize of the Commission of Science, Technology, and Industry for National Defense, which was the highest award in China and many senior researchers they dreamed to have. And this is Professor Yunguizi, and this is Professor Sa, was my uh, advisor for my PhD, co-supervisor for my PhD, and he was also a professor at the Nanyang Technological University of Singapore. And many of my peers are now generals and uh, or fellows in China. I was one of the national leaders of young computer scientists. Those leaders are now in prominent positions. Some of them are presidents of universities. One of them is uh, the Minister of Education in China. So since it's a bit sensitive to uh, put the pictures here, because uh, Helen reminded me that uh, this uh, may be not a good situation to put those pictures. So I just leave it blank. So I could have stayed at NUDT, but Helen, my wife, dragged me away to Beijing. She could not bear the heat of my home province. I have no regret. The, big, the best gift God gave me at NUDT is Helen, because she was the best student among her peers, and we got married in her final year at NUDT and it will be our 31st anniversary this October. And uh, here, this is uh, me and Helen in front of the department building. And this is a wedding photo uh, at my hometown. And this is a wedding photo, wedding photo at uh, Helen's hometown. So from this wedding photo, you can see whose family is richer. So my research at NUDT was focused on AI, and uh, now it's a very hot topic, but it was very hot too. Symbolic AI in contrast to the now popular connectionist, connectionist AI. Uh, it was about using symbols to represent the concepts in human mind, and using logic to simulate uh, 
simulate human reasoning. So here in this example, actually, uh, we could just create some logical rules according to the human mind thinking. And uh, the rule might be, in general, could be, uh, if raining, then we stay, stay at home. And if it's sunny, then we go out. So this is a very typical choice people may take. And uh, we have to generalize this kind of rules. And if we have fact, say, I was out yesterday, and then the inference could be yesterday was rainy, right? So this is an easy logic in inference. But we could have uh, millions of rules, such rules. And those rules could be conflict with each other. And the one rule could be override the other rule. So this is just uh, something very difficult to achieve in those days. And uh, we have, sometimes we have a high level rules. For example, if we really feel excited, even if it's raining, we want to go outside, right? And sometimes we get a spiritual inspiration and we want to, even if it's raining, we want to go out or pray in or do something special. So it's very hard to generalize these kind of rules. And the second one is collect all the facts, the data. I think it's equally, import, equally difficult nowadays to collect the data for AI study. So these two factors actually are the difficulties and the challenges in those days for symbolic AI. And Japan launched its fifth generation computer systems, which is based on the logic programming language Prolog. China responded with the famous 863 program. And my PhD thesis was to analyze the parallelism in Prolog and make it running in parallel. It was my first time learning C and created a pre created a pre-compiler for Prolog. And the whole system has more than 10,000 lines of code. And my work was published at a prestigious Pali conference and I got the best paper award in 1986, uh, 1989. And this is a souvenir of, of God because the conference was in Amsterdam and they have a souvenir of uh, small shoes, uh, wooden shoes like this. And of course, uh, the price also consists of a uh, thousand euro in that days. It's a big money for a poor Chinese student. So I finished my PhD thesis in 1992, and based on my work and the others of my team, we wrote two monograph books with researchers from NUDT and Tsinghua University. One of them was uh, by the best publisher in China. My supervisor, Professor Shou Renghong, was a pioneer of Chinese supercomputers uh, in the ranks of this, the Professor Yun Guizhi. And in the same year, Japan's fifth generation computer system project was declared as a failure. And the symbolic AI was at its lowest. But regardless, I had a very good training at AUDT. Apart from the AI theories, I had a very good training on computer engineering. At AUDT, any PhD student has to implement a prototype system if they propose a new computer system, no matter software or hardware. This was very tough at those times, and, uh, but the PhD students in those days were few and uh, the best. So at, at that time, I didn't realize that I was very privileged. Uh, basically, I was at the top of the food chain. I didn't need to consider any funding issue like that, and the funding is actually following me. So this is a picture of uh, my professor, my my supervisor, Professor Hu Shorong, and this is a Yun Guizhi. So they are, those days, they are working as a team to develop the China's fastest computer. So I feel frustrated about academic research because of the failure of the uh, symbolic AI. I started a company called Minsu with my classmates of the university. We developed an EEG analysis system running on Windows. I used artificial intelligence like a neural network uh, back propagation 
to classify the spatial patterns of epileptic EEG, so those kind of different uh, waves. And we sold the system to thousands of hospitals. After three, day, after three years, we were millionaires. And this is a, a, in the exhibition you know, me and it's just showing the system to the public. And this is my, Helen was joined me in those days and helping us sometimes for free, basically, and uh, also giving a demo for the system. So such experience allowed me to shepherd my students, uh, my students' childhood to start a company called EEG Smart in China in 2014. The company founded Otago to develop a prototype BCI system and also our BCI research. Based on the prototype, they have developed products ranging from a BCI system to a sleep monitoring system. So here you can see this is their devices used to, for the BCI to control the drill, very small drill. And here this is just sleep monitoring system. It's a much smaller device, just stick on the forehead. So in 1995, I got everything I wanted. Money, PhD, fame, a beautiful wife, a happy family. But I wanted to see the world. An opportunity came to me in 1996. I was employed as a postdoc at the university, uh, at the Griffith, Griffith University, Australia. Since then, I got back to academia. Two years later, the project was finished, and I moved to Otago in 1998. At that time, I left, I left my country, left my AI circle, and uh, left my Chinese academic, uh, academic community, and everything I was familiar with. And that, that year, I was already 33. And I felt like the little person here in front of the huge Western Ivory Tower. I lost it again, because now I got a much larger family and a second hometown. And also I've got a spiritual home. And here is this, my family, and this is just when we become a citizen of New Zealand and we get uh, the certificates. And this title actually make it exactly right, so scientists feel at home. So this is my home, and also my spiritual home. So I was recruited by Brian Cox, so I'm very grateful that Judy is here today. And uh, the, the recruited team includes uh, Ian McDonald. Ian is also here. I'm very much uh, very happy and moved by you attending my IPO. And the uh, recruit team includes Ian and also Margaret Jeffries. And they were very kind to me when they interviewed me. And uh, I got recruited immediately. And then I founded the Otago Systems Research Group a few years later. When I came, uh, there was no powerful computer systems or networks for research except the PCs. At that time, I started everything from scratch. I moved to computer systems research field and I chose cluster computing as my research. So basically, I started everything uh, from, from ground zero again. I was quite lowly in terms of research at that time. But luckily, I forgot a year who supported me spiritually and also very often invited me to their home groups. So that's a huge uh, uh, relief uh, during the high pressure. And also, Brian Cox supported me uh, my first ATM network switch is a powerful network used for research purpose and also can connect uh, many PCs together to do supercomputing work. And based on these devices, I uh, work with Professor Martin Purvis, co-founded telecommunication program.
And Cameron Kerr was my teaching fellow who did the significant contributions in the telecommunication, uh, in the telecommunication program. And in those days, I developed uh, course 301, uh, now uh, in the past called Tele 301, but now called course 301, and the course 244, and the course 402, or oh, Tele 402, those papers. And uh, they are still remain and evolved until now. At that time, my main research was to make many PCs working together to achieve supercomputing power. Since then, I have managed to secure funding for powerful, PC, uh, powerful computers because my research about computer systems is all about new computers. If you use old computers to do research, you won't be able to publish anything. Now the group has got a, a server room full of multiple computers. You can see these are frames. They are actually multiple, uh, multiple computers, some of them 64 cores, some, some of them 96 cores. And also we got a GPUs for research related to computer systems and uh, AI. And most importantly, we have got a more wonderful colleagues, young colleagues. They, their research is uh, highly ranked in computer networks and systems. We have also got dozens of postgraduates who completed their thesis. So many thanks to our IT support team, Alan, Dave, Tracy, Kathy, Malcolm, Malcolm Mills, and uh, Justin Teer, especially Alan, who is always very calm and cheerful, trying his best to satisfy our requests, sometimes it's all very tough requests. Without their support, it is impossible to keep the systems up to date or running. And it is worth mentioning Kay, who is our uh, administrator, who is very efficient and saved my time in many administrative jobs. So I was lucky to have her as our administrator for 20 years. So for cluster computing, I, pro I proposed and developed a parallel programming system called Vortica on cluster computers. It used a distributed shared memory for parallel programming on cluster computers. It is more convenient than using message passing like MPI. And Vodka was used by more than a dozen universities, including University of New South Wales and Tsinghua University. It had a better performance than the world leading trademark system developed by Rice University, led by Professor Willy Zavalapo. Willy moved to EPFL Switzerland in 2004 because of Vodka I had. Uh, I had a connection with Willy and was invited to EPFL for my sabbatical leave in 2005. But Willy moved away from the cluster computing area, moved away from distributed computing, and he also suggested me say change. You know, this is no hope in this field. Uh, DSM is dead. So I feel again a bit frustrated. So I implemented uh, Vodka on Jin virtual machine without any memory copying because those days really moved to virtualization and the thing was very hot in those days. So I have get a familiar with I mean, was learning I learned Zin, the hypervisor for show for virtualization. And also I have learned uh, Linux kernel programming from there. And this enabled me the capability of teaching kernel programming in course 440 at Otago. So this photo is a Willy. So he's very nice and kind. And this is my office at the EPFL. I should confess that this office is the largest office I ever had. It's a three times of my current office. So I, though I had a very good publication based on Vodka, DSM systems like Vodka and the trademarks, they were not accepted by the industry 
due to its lower performance than message parsing. So you can see in this field, even though you propose some good idea, it's very convenient. But performance, if it's not good, it's not going to be used. So performance is always the higher priority. So my research met another bottleneck. But however, as the saying goes, when God closes a door and he opens a window. Since 2003, some microsystems moved to making multi-core chips. In 2006, they were making multi-core chips with up to 64 cores. And this changed in the chip industry and the software development. And a single CPU is not going to accelerate anymore due to physical limitations. So all software have to move to parallel computing. And this brought a new chance for my research. And uh, Nicholas Adurdi, uh, he used his connection with some microsystems to start a company called World 45. And he proposed to me and uh, Martin Purvis to collaborate with some microsystems. And due to my expertise in parallel computing, along with Nicholas, I visited some microsystems a few times, presenting the case for Otago. After many effort in 2008, Otago became Sun Microsystems Open Spark Center of Excellence, which was the seventh center of excellence and the only one out of outside the United States. And Stuart Parson and Nicholas Dodi, they made a lot of effort for the establishment of the center. And Martin were the chief scientist. And uh, Marish, Marish here, he was also a key uh, researcher. And I'm very glad that my research contributed to the, uh, to the COE. And uh, here in the picture, that's, uh, I gave a talk to the Sound Research Center. And uh, standing there, we have got uh, Mark Moyer and uh, the yeah, Morris Hurlinghe, Morris Hurlinghe. So these are the father of transaction memory in, for some microsystems. So because of those days, to, for the convenience of the system, they use hardware to support parallel computing, and they propose transaction, transactional memory, and which they started first. So it was all good in those days. Oh, I forgot to mention that uh, Brendan was the uh, uh, center of, the manager of the center of excellence. And uh, sadly, uh, in 2000, 2009, some microsystems was acquired by Oracle. And Oracle discontinued its production of open spark architecture. So since then, I, my research moved towards Multi-core computing, even though uh, there was a change of the uh, uh, direction for some microsystems. We don't use some microsystems anymore, so we move to Intel's multi-core machine. Oh, this is a plug for the Center of Excellence, hiring at the uh, Center for Innovation Building. So if you visit the building, you can see on the wall you will see the, this plug. OK, together with uh, Tsinghua University, we proposed and implemented a view-oriented parallel programming system for multiple clusters. It's called a Maotai, and it's more convenient than MTI. And the Maotai is uh, the, you know, Maotai is the best alcohol in China. And the reason we name it the multi is because we believe multi is better than vodka, the Russian alcohol. So though uh, uh, this is just, I think, the picture of Professor Zhen and the Professor Wen Guang Chen. So Wen Guang is the uh, director, I think, a standing director of Chinese Federation of Computer. And uh, Professor Chen is a fellow of Chinese Academy of Sciences. 
So these are all important uh, figures in China in computing field. So though Mao Tai is uh, accepted by academia, you know, we publish papers, but in the industry, they either use MPI, message passing, and not convenient, but the performance is very good, or use Intel's OpenMP or MIT Silk or multiple computers, and they are more convenient than Mao Tai, but cannot support programming on cluster computers. So I decided to seek collaboration with MIT Silk Group. Here's a picture of my family in Tsinghua University in 2005. So in 2009, I visited MIT for six months as a visiting scientist. Professor Charles Lysenson was my host. I helped the design of memory mapping, uh, memory mapping for silk implementation inside the Linux kernel. So here you can see that silk actually can call functions and make functions to run in parallel. And when the function A call function B and C, and the function B and C can run in parallel at the same time. So that they have to share the stack of function A at some stage. And then C could just sprawl, sprawl two more tasks, and D and E. And then D and E should share the stack of C and also share the stack of A. And without the kernel programming support, like memory mapping, we make, can't make it efficient. And also, we want to make it interact with the legacy code. So we have a lot of tradition, traditional code. And those legacy code need to call silk. And the silk should be able to call them. So this makes the implementation very complicated, combining the complication inside the Linux kernel. It was very challenging. I also created a profiling system for the performance analysis. So I uh, read the performance counters in the Linux kernel and get those data for performance analysis. And also I can uh, analyze the you know, profiling the uh, registers, uh, performance counters, and uh, analyze if they're following some linear regression trend to give some predictions. Also in MIT, I uh, learned a lot from uh, Charles in writing technical papers. And in MIT, I think it's also very eye-opening to see how much resources they have. So they basically have dozens of seminars every day, and then lots of pieces before each seminar. So you basically, as a student, you don't need to go for lunch or dinner. You just go to a seminar. And here I'm holding uh, the MIT mascot called Tim the Beaver. So several months after I left MIT, uh, I received an email from the Silk Group asking me to help debug the system with a tight time limit. I was very troubled with the request because first it was not uh, my bug, it's not my code. Second, it's a very large system that has more than 50,000 lines of code, just C code. And third, I would feel ashamed if I couldn't, if I promised and I couldn't find a bug. It seems, uh, you know, it's a kind of Chinese typical thinking of face, uh, face losing. So the best way for me is to find an excuse to decline the request. But somehow, I promised to have a look. So within two days, I found the bug. The first day was used to set up the local environment. So that uh, takes a lot of time. In those days, I have to specially compile the whole kernel, which takes several hours to finish. And the second day, I pinpoint the problem. So the problem is, they don't have these two assembly code, in assembly code, to be able to write the content of a register into the memory. And later on, after the application is finished, then they need to load the data back from the memory back to the register. 
This is about the hand compilation. So you use some registers, and if you mess them up, you have to store them in the memory, just in case later on you need to use, and then you reload it. But we don't have a full compiler yet in those days. So we, everything's hand compiled. So I pinpoint this problem and fix it, along with many other, uh, many other bugs. I mean, some kernel also is not fully working in those days. So, and this kind of experience is very much like a looking for, you know, looking for a needle in a haystack. So this is a, even more challenging than that because in this kind of problem, the needle is smart needle. They sometimes appear, they sometimes disappear. So it's like a ghost, ghost needle. And also, the needle could be camouflaged. You know, they hide itself and change appearance. So that's very challenging. So needless to say, I earned more respect from the group after this. But however, I should confess that I prayed before I took the job. So I seriously prayed. About the MIT Silk, uh, it was later acquired by, by Intel, but discontinued in 2008. You can see the industry is very cruel. You know, MIT Silk was to be very, the best system in this field, but due to competition, a lot of other reasons and the political reasons, Intel bought it, but eventually ditched it. Uh, at MIT, I did a leadership training, uh, did a, a course for, yeah, anyway. So that's good. I found it very helpful. And also, I learned sailing. Okay, that's really good. I regret I didn't grow up in the Western country in the United States or New Zealand. Otherwise, I would be a very, very good sailor. I learned in, in three courses only, and I can just doing the tagging uh, freely. And I, with my daughter's help, she didn't do anything. So I was a little bit wrist uh, bold. She didn't do any course, but I just tell her what to do. And then we sail back and forth the Charles River uh, several times. So that was uh, very fun. Also at MIT, uh, I joined their parallel and distributed operating system group. I learned a lot from them about operating systems, uh, especially the teaching operating system called Unix version 6, XV6. But it was running on a simulated environment uh, called a QMU. I ported XV6 to a real PC and started teaching OS with XV6 at Otago after coming back to uh, coming back from MIT. So I created the advanced operating system paper, course 440, for in the practice of MIT. Uh, Franz and Robert, they gave me a lot of help for me porting to PC. And actually, you might be interested to know, uh, Robert was the inventor of the first internet worm uh, in 1998, which disrupted hundreds of DARPA computers. That's the first internet incident. So in those days, uh, uh, in my department, the PC is not going to be used. Even though I put the system to PC and they turn to Mac, everything's a Mac. So I can't use PC for teaching OS anymore. So I was looking for a small computer called Raspberry Pi for teaching OS. So in 2013, I visited Cambridge University for putting XV6 to Raspberry Pi. And the Professor Robert Mullins was my host. He gave me all possible support I need to put XV6 on Raspberry Pi. And he was very kind and nice, almost respond to my request immediately. Such a porting job is very demanding but rewarding. I got a rich working knowledge of computer architecture 
and always. The code repository at the moment, I think, is still steadily and actively used around the world. So you can see this uh, access pattern chart. And from such experience, I also started teaching programming with Raspberry Pi and Arduino because I have feel more comfortable with computer architecture and the computer hardware. And also I started Internet of Things as a research direction because I also feel, along with Hyper, I feel more comfortable with handling those hardware small devices. And I spent about three months to uh, port x 6 on Raspberry Pi. And since then, I started my outreach experience. Uh, I started the Hi2 coding club. And before that, I learned a lot from Ian Hewson, who actually uh, taught me. Or basically, we, we were called co-leaders, but actually, I just watched him is doing teaching hands-on science to high school students. And I followed him for several years before I started my own project for OUISSA. So I learned a lot from there. Because initially, I would be scared to teach high school students. And finally, I started a high to coding club for high school students. And in the porting job, I also, uh, I also have done the job in Shanghai Jiao Ting University. And the Shanghai Jiao Ting University is my long-term collaborator. Since 2010, we collaborated on multiple computing and its applications. The collaboration is very productive in terms of publications at top journals and conferences. And the train here, and the picture on the right is a student of uh, Professor Guo. And he worked under my supervision for about two years. And later on, he uh, graduated and then uh, moved to different universities. And finally, settled down in Shanghai Jiao Ting University. And now he's a professor. So we kept the collaboration for a long time. Later on, we have another student called Xiao Xin who uh, is working on image processing on GPU. And uh, Stephen and uh, David joined us. And we had a wonderful collaboration and uh, published several papers at the top ranked journals and the conferences. And the system research is all about performance. So we normally use low level performance counters to find out the performance problem. And once we find it out, we try to figure out what should, could be the solution. So for example, here you can see that the curve is about to speed up. The, the, the x-axis here is about the number of uh, cores, or uh, number of processors, or sometimes we call it CPUs. So we have uh, used up to 64 CPUs in this problem. And uh, for this particular algorithm, when we're running on 64 processors, we expect it should have close to 64 times faster compared to one CPU. Okay, But actually, in reality, we only get about 10 times acceleration. Only 10 times. That's very low. And then this curve is the one we, after we improve the performance by using a fast memory and also by changing the algorithm, and using smart algorithm to avoid extra overhead. And we get a super scale, super scale uh, sp speed up in this case. So you can see we get about 200 times of speed up compared with, with a single CPU. So this is uh, what our effort. Maybe the problem is this is different, but the curve is the same. We always want the curve to be upright, to be linearly increasing. But of course, here you can see that it sometimes it's get bent. Bent is not good. We don't want it to be bent. We want it to be always straight up. 
So this is the effort we are doing for system research. We always pay a lot of attention to the performance. So without a powerful bare metal level performance profiling, it is not possible to find the performance problems to solve. And along with new computers, this is the capability of a leading system research group must have. And the picture here is just uh, the performance I've just uh, explained. So compared with uh, limited resources I have at Otago, uh, I, together with my collaborators, have achieved a lot in computer systems. Uh, for example, parallel computing, multi-core computing, operating systems. But however, I found there was little impact in New Zealand society. No matter how good we feel about the research overseas, but actually in New Zealand, a lot of the public don't really care about what we are doing. So it's very difficult, also it's very difficult to get funded for system research. So I decided to push and apply computer system to cross-disciplinary research. And in 2014, founded by EEG Smart, basically my student, Chao He, and uh, Liz Franz and I worked on BCI project. We collected motor imagination EEG data and analyzed the classification accuracy. And Phoebe and Xiping were employed as a postdoc and a research assistant. And the motor imagination is different from person to person. So if you have one person to imagine the movement, because uh, this kind of system is for disabled people, they're supposed to be, cannot move properly. They are, sometimes their neural system has got a problem. So they can't use their hand to reach anything, but they can use imagination to imagine their movement in their brain, and we can find out the brain signal. But some people can do it very well, but some people can't. Some people can reach about 90% accuracy, some can only about 60. And we found out the problem is a kind of crosstalk problem between the two sides of the brain. Uh, just like if you want to move your hand, left hand, and at the same time you want to move right hand for a different, different action, like left hand moving as in circle, but right hand move in square. I think it's very hard to do, right? It's better to do this, or moving in the same circle, or moving in square. That's easy. So because of this kind of crosstalk, actually, the classification the signal between the left and the right brain is hard to distinguish. So we found this problem and get it published at the journal. And 60 years later, actually, this publication. So one warning I would say is that well, for my fellow colleagues, if you want to start cross-disciplinary research, it's a very challenging and risky. It takes much longer time to see the outcome. But as a byproduct, I designed and implemented a mind control system, which is used as in many situations in science events. And this kind of system is also used by the Brain Health Research Center at the moment. This stands for outreaching and to get engaged with kids and advertising brain knowledge or mental health. So then I also moved to uh, funding biomarkers for depression using artificial intelligence. The reason why I moved to this one is because I, I have some friends. They suffer from depression and they took the drugs. And the drugs had a huge side effect. And sometimes they don't know which drug is more suitable, more effective. They have to try and error, try and error. And by the time when they try it, if it doesn't work, they suffer a lot. So. We would like to find out the biomarker. If we find the biomarker, we will know if this drug really worked immediately from the brain waves. So that's the research. Uh, that's why I'm doing this kind of research for depression. 
And initially, I worked with Neil, Phoebe, and Brendan, and also uh, Paul Galou. And we tried to apply for Marsden uh, five times, but eventually, uh, five times actually, we we'll get in the second round, but eventually we didn't get the final one. So it's very tough. And uh, now we joined, the team joined with uh, uh, Veronica and Naran from psychology, and uh, Dirk and uh, Divya from neurosurgery. So we have got their data at the moment. We got a very good classification results. We got more than 90% classification accuracy at the moment. But we still got big trouble. Oh, by the way, uh, here we have got past PhD students like David and Shenhua. They are working in this project. And also at the moment, I have got another student, Xian Heng, is working on it. And our 400 level student, Taya and Julius, are working on it. And Taya is working on the depression data at the moment. He did a very good contribution and uh, had a very good results so far. But the research is very challenging because we use AI as connectionist AI. As I said, connectionist AI compared to a symbolic AI is that they can automate the rule generation. So you don't need to worry about all those rules taken from human mind. They can just generate the rules directly from the data. The problem is we don't know what rules they use. It's like a black box. So for example here, for the images, like if you want to train the model with a dog and a cat, basically you just train it. Train it means you beat it. You beat a bit uh, sort of a beast. It's a dog, dog, like that. And eventually it will be you know, recognized most of the time, say this is a dog. And then you can do the same for the cat. And then they will be able to recognize cat. So this is a model. Normally nowadays works very well, very good, very efficient. But however, the model is not known clearly. It's not interpretable so far. And people are trying to do it, trying to unlock the black box. But however, in our problem, we have even more challenging uh, situation. It's called a triple blind problem. First, the EEG data, we don't really know what the data contain. It's not just like, uh, this is a dog, this is a cat. This data is depression data, maybe. Or is related to depression, even collected from depressed people, but may not be. So this is not very clear. And also the label here is not very clear. How severe of the depression, we don't know. The, at the moment, it's very subjective. The score is, they fill a questionnaire, and then they give you a score, and actually, I can trick it out. I can make myself as a depressed people if I want to. I, can, I know exactly how to answer those questions. But I also can trick it out as make myself as a healthy people. You know, if you really want to, you studied those forms, you could be able to trick it out. So those labels is not very reliable. And uh, of course, the third one, the model is not known, even if you know the model. You don't know what kind of rules driving them. It's a black box. So that's very challenging. So the pressure is very high, but our news has already been spread out. So this is a new starting point in my career. I don't know what will happen next, but I have taken a very challenging task. And also, this is my journey so far. And, uh, also, it's just my, most of my personal research theme does not include my uh, colleagues, uh, my colleagues' research or student research, like Haiber and Yawen, they have done wonderful research. And also Jason and Lila and uh, Faisal and uh, Kieran, this, our students have done very uh, different research projects. So I didn't include anything in, in this talk. Uh, and I would like to acknowledge my colleagues, my collaborators, my students, and all my co-authors. So this is a long list.
Yeah, also, uh, I should say, because I want to sing a song to wrap it up. Uh, maybe you think I'm a very good singer, but actually not, I'm a very poor singer. But uh, however, I have got a wonderful church family. Their brothers and sisters, they would like to sing the song on my behalf. So just a few minutes for you to enjoy. And a special thanks to uh, Brian Cox, who brought me here, and my parents, who brought me to this world, and to my family, Helen, and my children, and also uh, especially to Helen, who, uh, my wife, who actually devoted all her love to me, and finally my Lord and my Savior, Jesus Christ, for his eternal love and uh, salvation. Without Jesus Christ, I'm nothing. And the hand over to I do not know where to go after that. Um, so my name is Brendan McCain. I'm the head of the department of computer science, and um, I've got a couple of jobs. So first, I want to thank G for a wonderful talk today and very um, nice view of his progression through life. Um, and, it, and most things have been said, but I wanted to uh, highlight a couple, I think, um, especially in relation to um, the computer science department. So G, since he's been here, has had a profound impact really on the department, especially in terms of um, teaching, and research in computer systems. He sort of led this group. Um, he's been a very strong proponent of the importance of computer systems teaching in our curriculum, and this has been maintained um, through the whole time that he's been here, really. And as he said, he started um, up the systems research group, and he's really considered um, a father figure in, this, in the systems research group. So not, in not just in terms of his work and his research and his teaching, 
but also all the things that happen after hours. So in developing the group and the people in the group that have joined both students and staff. So things like um, helping new members get New Zealand driver's license and helping them uh, around town to find a house you know, to buy and generally let, helping them settle in. Um, and one thing I really do want to focus on is that, importantly, Jesus genu genuinely a very good person. So we, we've seen that his Christian faith is a core part of his being, but his moral core, I think, is even stronger than that. So despite his research seeming to focus on um, a fair amount of booze, vodka and Mao Tai, uh, I've never seen him have a drink actually, so I don't think he, he likes that um, um, very much. But his, his moral core stands out very strong, and this is um, how he deals with all the people, really, in his life. And I want to sort of finish off with a quote that I gathered from uh, one of the members of the group, and it goes like this. It says, he is one of the best friends, colleagues, group leaders, who is the most trustable, kind, and helpful person. And I think you really couldn't ask for a better testimonial than that. So um, I'm keeping it fairly short because we're kind of running a bit late on time. But I want to thank Ji very much for his contributions to the department and to the university. And I have a gift for Ji. So thank you very much. Here you go. And thank you all for coming. Um, and thank you to the people who joined us online. And I'd like to invite you all to the staff club. We're going to have some refreshments. Um, I don't know if there will be any vodka or Mao Tai there, but uh, we'll be able to um, have a drink of something at least. Um, so thank you very much, and thank you again, G, for a wonderful talk.